This is my interview with Neil Doherty and Noah Body, the man with two names. The man with two names. Right. Okay, so why are you the man with two names? Um, but the story behind that came from an old 60s uh, Spider-Man cartoon. I posted on the Facebook site a few times. Uh, Dr. Noah Body, he was the invisible man. Damn. Yeah, it's the alter ego, primarily for Facebook, more than anything else. Yeah. And is it your artistic name? No, I go by Neil P. Doherty. Okay, so you're from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. What's your favorite childhood memory from that time in your life? I don't know, I think just growing up uh, as a kid, you know, lately I re you know, reflect on um, youth and the time, the freedom you had, the time you had um, to do whatever you wanted to do. But that must have been quite a beautiful place to grow Absolutely. up in. Absolutely. Huge open yard, crab apple trees, a big garden, you know, a pine tree that my sister and I would climb and get on the roof and all that stuff. It was just, yeah, it was neat growing up in that and having, um, and having that, uh, that experience. So, you're a mechanical engineer by trade. Mm -hmm. Which came first, your interest in the art or interest in engineering, do you think? Um, I think it would be kind of both. Um, as a young kid playing with a lot of Lego and Tinker Toy and um, just building things and taking things apart and trying to put them back together, sometimes not very successfully, but um, just being creative with that sort of, in that sort of realm. Um, and then always having that creative spirit um, growing up. Uh, throughout high school, I was, a, uh, I was transferred to a, a high school with fine arts program. Um, got the fine, fine arts diploma through there and had intentions to uh, continue on. Um, but always had an interest in science, mathematics. Um, and in 1988, uh, September 22nd, I was in a mega car crash. Um, and not comatose, but I was in the hospital for a while, and uh, when I got out, my grades are still great, but all of a sudden my biology was, you know, it used to be a 60, it was now in the 90s, and physics and calculus, yeah, and all these... So it all went up? All went up, yeah, something rattled one side of my brain. I guess that would be the left side. So the right side remained intact, the left side got shaken up, and I kind of balance this fine line sometimes. How long have you been doing ceramics? Um, probably, you know, when you're elementary school, when they first give you clay. I just really enjoyed doing it. Um, kind of stopped throughout, you know, university, and I picked up uh, ceramics again back in 2010. So there was a... I'll go a 12 year lapse where I didn't do any ceramics or art for that matter. Where do you get your inspiration? Everywhere. Um, you, sometimes from what things I see and they you know, manifest themselves into these creatures. Uh, other times just I've had dreams where this image is there. I wake up, scratch it on a piece of paper. I like the three-dimensional aspect of it. I like the tangible, you know, I can get my hands on it and I can make it something. And with a two-dimensional object, um, you know, it's kind of what you see is what you get. Not that it's a bad thing, but you take a 2D object and if you could just peer around that corner and see what's right behind it, you know, and I, that's where I really enjoy doing this around. So it's more compelling to you to... Absolutely. What other mediums have you worked in? Uh, I painted in acrylics, um, did a lot of that, and that was very similar um, because you could control it. You could, I, I could just, I just liked the way the texture of, of acrylics would, would play out when I painted with them. Um, similar to what I do with glazes, where I can mix different acrylics together to get different colors that you know you wouldn't expect to get. I try to. I'm now learning to play around that with uh, with glazes. Um, photography is something I do, but not as much anymore. I, I'm trying to boil my niches down to just one. Yeah, I think, you know, you get a better product if, you, if you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Your work has many delicate tendrils and extensions. Do you worry about this when you're firing a piece? Um, I've been lucky, I, I suppose. When I first started doing the tendril type things, um, it was, again, what I felt and, and just as I'm working and visualizing what I see. 
uh, to have it come out of the, or to actually try to figure out how you're gonna now put it in the kiln, and then uh, safely, and then when you remove it, yeah. Now what happens is, it's not necessarily planned, but there's a lot more thought given to, you know, how are you gonna be able to handle this piece? Are you gonna be able to manipulate it when you're glazing it? Um, but still not interfere with that creative side of things, you know, things don't necessarily have to be in a certain place. You can just be free for all. Do you them. lose lots of pieces or not too many? I've, um, I've only had one piece ever explode in my kiln. The calculations of creating a piece that's hollow, you know, everything I do is completely hollow. And that takes a lot of thought. I guess it's through experience now. I mean, it's essentially like a popcorn kernel with water in it. You know, if you heat it up, it's going to explode. Same thing if it's a, if it's pockets of air, that's going to expand, or explode, or crack. And do you know what colors you're going to use beforehand, or do you decide sometimes, after the piece is fired? Some, most of the time, um, it would be it would be beforehand. Um, but again, now I'm trying to experiment with glazes and. Um, I'm trying to do that with test tiles as opposed to doing with actual pieces. But you know, I've, I've contacted several people trying to figure out how to do a pink chrome glaze. I have a piece up here, Holly the Giraffe, that I want it to look like cotton candy, shiny cotton candy, but not, but with chrome, you know, a, a reflective surface. And uh, no one can tell me how this is done. So. I've been reading recipes and trying them out and still, so that's something I'm going to try to attain one day. I have colors in mind, but that's not always the colors I end up using. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the piece changes throughout start to finish that, you know, maybe what I thought should be bright now is darker. So what do you think is your favorite piece, ceramic piece that you've done? I think all of them. I enjoy them all. I can't pick. I can't pick one and say this is this is the one that I, I, I like most. Um, I think everything I create. I mean, I have that ability to smash it all together if I don't like it. Um, and not to say I haven't smashed pieces when they were finished. I don't do that anymore. But uh, um, I, I would say I guess it would be depending on my mood, you know, and certain pieces where I was in life at the time, I, you know, I um, may hold on to it. They may have more sentimental value for certain reasons. Are you as attached to them when you're finished? Or are you more attached to them when you're in the process? Well, I, I try to care for it and nurture it like a child as I'm making it uh, because it's delicate. It's, it's very fragile and, and the way I set these things up they don't uh, you know putting long necks of clay out with no structure to hold them together you have to be thinking about it and, you know I like, will go peer on on them now and then as they're drying out do they get propped up as you're working on them some, some of them, them yeah I mean they'll you have, have to have right to, yeah yeah um, sometimes gravity is your friend and sometimes it's your worst enemy tell me about the erotic art festival and the piece that you had in it? Um, well, I had, I submitted three pieces. I, I had these pieces in mind with no idea, uh, not, not, not a thought of uh, submitting them to the festival. And um, two of them are very similar. They're long swooping figures or forms of, I visualize serpentine, snake-like. Um, with human features, like hands clasped, um, or long hands, you know, long fingernails pressed together, praying hands, if you will. Um, and they were just, that was just an idea that I had in my head. The third piece was, I guess, my first true attempt at a, the human figure and the face. <coughs> um, the figure, I think it turned out quite well. The face, I'm not happy with, but you know, it was my first time and it's going to take a lot of practice to uh, perfect it. But in the end, uh, I had a friend suggest that I enter them and uh, two of them were accepted. The two swoopy pieces were accepted. And so I was happy with that. So was that an interesting experience? It was a, it was a cool event to be part of, I think.
yeah. did you see some good work? There was some incredible work. There was some um, very creative work. And then there was things that, I don't know, I mean, it, not, your not, thing. not everything turns everybody's boat. Yeah, right. it makes them happy. Uh, but no, there was, there's a few things, and I'll have to say that I, was, I, I left there inspired to do more. So, if you were asked to do a ceramic sculpture of yourself, what would it look like, and what would you be doing? I think every piece I do has a little bit of me in it. But, well, that's what it is, I think, you know. Uh, I, I'm just kind of looking at my pieces, and again, yeah, everything I, I do, there's something about me in them. And that was the very same thing with painting or photography. It's what I see that I want other people to see. Now, you ready for this question? I don't know. You'll have to ask. So this is the grand finale okay. question. You're asked to do a display of your work floating on small blue rafts on a quiet lake. The display would be at nighttime, only illuminated by floating lanterns. Your water exhibition needs to be cohesive. What kind of work would you make for this project? Um, I think I recently, um, I've been trying to follow these flowing lines. And I think, um, you know, the study of, you know, just natural lines in nature. Uh, waves have lines and I think, um, incorporating that it's like a dark sexy um, with into a piece like that large um, very large to uh, what color well it's dark so <laughs> um, I think it would be a, a, a rainbow of colors but you know leaning to purples and reds and oranges um, maybe to like greens and blues, depending on how it flowed, but you know, maybe higher up, brighter colors down to darker colors to almost blend in with the water and the rafts. So many rafts holding one large piece, yes, perhaps. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or several of them dancing together. Yes. And now I'd like to know what you have upcoming. I have ideas for larger pieces. Um, and these pieces here, since I've moved to a larger space, have tended to grow as the space got larger. And now I have visions of doing larger pieces, um, you know, several feet. Um, and I also would like to get into the metal casting aspect of it, because I've had several ideas for a long time on, I think, some pretty cool uh, art installations. Would you combine ceramics and metal together? I thought about combining uh, ceramic and glass to start with. Um, I do have um, a piece in mind. Um, it's titled The Cock Train, which may uh, include uh, metal as well as glass and, and definitely ceramics. Um, but I also wanted, I've been thinking about some fountain-like pieces. Um, and just larger installations. I mean, I guess it's the, maybe not the goal of every artist, but m me personally, is to become more recognized, um, to, do, to be able to do larger installations where um, they're permanent installations. Um, so I have that, those goals. I'm excited to see that work. Well, I'm excited to get started. So Neil, this has been a pleasure learning about your work. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mimi. And I look forward to the things in the future. Me too. Thank Me too. you. Thank you.